Welcome back to ECE 441-541. As you're looking down the goals for today, there is a quiz today, and that's to get you ready for a quiz in, or an exam in two weeks. How's that for a jolt of adrenaline on a Friday morning early? But before we have our quiz, we are going to talk about the equations of motion for a DC motor. And there's DC motors all over the place. It might be nice to understand how do you, or how do you model those, or where do those equations come from. The equations are actually contained in a table in your book, and we will try to derive that and then show how you can actually reduce the order of that system if you neglect certain dynamics where those certain dynamics are the electrical dynamics versus the mechanical dynamics. And I want you to start getting comfortable with this concept of time constants and which ones, which dynamics might be more important than others in terms of the model that you're interested in describing. Today, some of you have already turned in your homework. It's due today. Exam, or I'm sorry, homework number two will be somewhere squeezed between today and in two weeks. I need to figure out when that will happen. Homework two will be before exam number one, and we also need to start worrying about lab number one. And this is sort of the material that we're hoping to have completed prior to exam number one which means today we'll go through the DC motor, we'll have a linearization quiz, we may start the linearization process, and then shortly we'll start talking about finding a system or identifying a system by means of time domain step response trajectories. How can we use this if we hit the system with a step input it's going to generate an output. Can we use that output to actually find the transfer function of our system? That's called system identification, and that's really what you're doing in lab number one. Before we get there, let's begin today by developing the equations. for a DC motor. If you happen to fall asleep between now and 8.50, I'll give you a hint. If you only want to find the transfer function, you can find that in table 2.5, line number 6. And if you are following along with the 12th edition of the textbook, That's actually on page 77 of the 12th edition of the text. That particular DC motor is one that's referred to as armature controlled. So we control this by adjusting the dynamics and or controlling the system through the armature of our motor. We're not going to have to get into all of these motor. This is not a machines class, but that's one of the descriptors for describing this particular type of DC motor. The other thing that we will be using in this particular motor is that it has a permanent magnet in it that allow, gives us this magnetic field that we then use to keep this motor spinning or to help this motor spin. Those are the two things that are characterizing this particular structure of a DC motor. Let's now see if we can sketch a rough schematic and the DC motor is a combination of an electrical system and a mechanical system. They play together, they play nicely together, and that allows us to convert electrical energy into mechanical energy, which we do all the time. So this is referred to as an electromechanical 
system. Which means in the schematic we're going to try to have two pieces to it. We have an electrical piece. And those should be very familiar to all of us that are comfortable with electrical pieces. We have some resistance in the armature circuit. We have some inductance. There's a lot of coils in there, and so that has an inductive effect. Then that actually goes over to help drive the motor by produce, well, the motor being spun actually produces a dependent voltage which we will call V sub B and that's the back electromotive force and here is our voltage that we apply to the electrical side. The process of spinning the shaft of the motor, the faster the motor spins, the bigger this electromotive force so V, v sub B actually starts growing. And here is now our connection between the electrical side and the mechanical side. That's my shaft. That's the shaft of the motor, and now that's attached to some rotating load. And I'm just going to schematically draw that by a cylinder that you could think of as a massive cylinder, something that has inertia. And then the motor actually imparts a torque, tau sub m, to that shaft, spinning the shaft and causing it to rotate, giving it some displacement, angular displacement, theta, and some angular velocity, the derivative of theta, which we will probably refer to as omega. Omega is equal d theta dt. This is now our electromechanical schematic of a DC motor, where the DC motor is armature controlled. Here's the armature circuitry. It has some resistance just because there's some electrical pieces to it. There's a lot of coils in there, so it has some inductance. It drives this shaft, and what we want to do is actually create this current, I sub A, in the armature circuitry, the bigger that current is, the more torque we can exert on the motor shaft. The torque is proportional to the current in the armature circuitry. Quantities that we're interested in, our input is the motor voltage, V of T, And eventually, we'll take that into the frequency domain to find a transfer function. That will now become this capital V of S as our input. And our output, to be consistent with the textbook, the output is the angular displacement, theta. But you could look at the angular velocity, which is the derivative of this also as an output. That that's pretty easy to go from theta to omega. So we'll just look at being consistent with the textbook's transfer function. So this is now the angle of our shaft that's associated with our DC motor. And when we Laplace transform that, it will become theta of s. We now want to find a transfer function between the input voltage and the output angle, theta of x. To do that, we're going to look at this in two pieces, and then hopefully those pieces will be interconnected or related, the electrical part and the mechanical part. I'll call it the electrical side and the mechanical side, and that coupling will allow us to connect the input to the output so that when we apply a voltage, that motor starts spinning. That's the idea. And the dynamics will tell us how it gets to its rotating position. All right, let's look at the electrical side. And the electrical side, 
shouldn't be very hard to analyze for the electricals. That's just a simple KVL. We just go around that electrical side. We have a couple of voltages. That V sub B is treated as a dependent voltage source, but we'll just denote it as V sub B for now. And then we have a current flowing through a resistor and an inductor, and we know those time or those current voltage relationships for the resistor and the inductor. Here's the electrical side. Doing our KVL, we have minus V of T plus R sub A, I sub A, and this is now in the time domain. I've shown the T on one of the variables. I'll probably leave it off on all the others. Our inductance, and now what's the voltage drop across an inductor in terms of the current going through that inductor? That's the derivative time. It's proportional to the inductance, and it's then multiplied or scaled by the derivative of the current. That's E of I, L D I D T plus V sub B, and all of that is equal to zero. This is in the time domain. As I said before, this V of T is our applied voltage, R sub A is the resistance in the armature, so we could call that the armature resistance, we're in the armature circuit, the current then is the armature current, somebody wants you to start talking about these, or they may parameterize a motor and say, oh, the armature resistance is this value. The inductive, res or the armature inductance is this value. And then you know where those go in the subsequent model or the transfer function that we will end up deriving. V sub B is the back electromotive force or the back EMF. Questions on that? That's a fairly basic KVL equation. Now what we haven't talked about much is that V sub B, so let's parameterize that or break that apart a little bit more and that's where we actually get the connection between the electrical and the mechanical sides of our electromechanical system. The back EMF, which we've simply labeled as V sub B, is actually proportional to the rotational speed of that shaft, which I'm calling omega. So this is, this K sub B is the back EMF, let's say proportionality constant, and omega is the angular velocity. Now, if you look in the textbook, this back EMF constant is actually proportional to, or is equal to the motor constant K sub M. Those are, can be shown to be equivalent, and a lot of times we just, if we have one, we may substitute in the other. This is now K sub M as our motor constant. And that's now equal to K sub B. So we have K sub M omega, or this is now K sub M D theta DT. And that now allows us to connect the electrical side, this dependent voltage in our electrical circuit 
equation with something mechanical, which is the angular rate of rotation of that shaft. And the notation that we were using then, we were saying that omega sub t is d theta dt, and we've used the fact that based on a power balance, you can show that k sub b is equal to k sub m, and that's in, described in the textbook. on page 73. If we now use those relationships or that expression for the back EMF in our electrical side dynamics, we can now say that, oh, we have minus V of T plus R sub A I sub A plus L sub A I sub A prime plus k sub m theta prime is equal to zero. I'm now using primes to indicate my derivative just to save space. That's now my electrical side equation that governs the armature circuitry. You, imply, or you supply a voltage and that now turns the shaft, but you have to relate that to the current flowing in the armature circuitry. Let's now look at the mechanical side. This is analogous to what we've ta been talking about and what's in your homework with the linear mechanical system, except now it's rotational. If this is now our rotational inertia, this is now like our mass in the linear case, now we have some inertia that's rotating with an angle of theta. To get that started, we have a mechanical torque, tau sub n. Now, if we, and so here, if you're not used to thinking rotationally, this torque is analogous to force in our translational. So here's rotational dynamics and here's translational. If we applied a force to a mass, to an inertia, what happened when we applied that force? It accelerated, but if we, so that's, and the acceleration gives us the inertial force, doesn't it? So we try to move this mass, and it, its inertia tried to oppose that movement. The same with this, sh this big load, this rotational road of load. If we try to turn it, the inertia is actually giving a torque against that, an inertial torque. Let me now... label that like I did before with this dashed line, and now let me call that tau sub i. So I now have this inertial torque that's opposing the force that's trying to get it to rotate. And now I'm not going to put a spring on this, a rotational spring, so I'm not going to have a spring force, but I will have, maybe this is in some fluid, and it has some damping associated with it. I'm going to now have some damping due to the velocity, rotational velocity of that load, and in that case, which direction is the damping torque going to be directed? Red or blue? It's going to be in the same direction as the inertia, right? If I'm now rotating this and I have some damping, it's going to be opposing the movement in the direction of theta. So now I have this 
let me call this tau sub b for the damping torque. And consistent with what we've done translationally, and because we're using the inertial torque, like we did the inertial force, now all we have to do is say the sum of the torques is equal to zero. Which says that in this picture, I simply algebraically combine these torques. I have the red torque and that must equal the blue torques since they're going in opposite directions. So that now I have tau sub m, the motor torque, equaling the inertial torque plus the rotational damping torque. This is now our motor torque. Here is our inertial torque. And this is now our rotational damping torque. And that's the equilibrium equation for from our free body diagram. Now what we need to do is find the physical relationships that give us these torques in terms of the system parameters. One thing that I have said earlier on is that motor torque is actually proportional to the current flowing in the armature circuitry. Meaning, now I have K, tau sub m is equal to k sub m i sub a, and that dot is not a derivative. So I'm using primes for my derivatives this morning, or in the first part of this lecture. That's just the current in the armature circuit. Again, this is our motor constant, k sub m. And the motor torque is what we're saying here. is proportional to the armature current. That's all that equation is saying. Where that motor constant, you could think of as having units of Newton meters per ampere. Now, if you had to speculate I didn't say guess. I said if you had to speculate, what, how would you parameterize or describe the inertial torque in terms of the system parameters? And think back analogously to how you found the inertial force in a translational system. Think Newton. Mass times acceleration, wasn't it? That was your inertial force in the translational. Now, in a rotational, you have rotational inertia, maybe a J. And what's analogous to acceleration in the linear direction? Rotational acceleration. So the inertial torque is simply the rotational inertia, J, times the angular acceleration. Tau sub I now, the inertial torque, is going to equal j times theta double prime. That's all I'm saying here is tau sub i now, we can describe it in terms of the system parameters. Now we've introduced a new parameter. This is now our rotational inertia, this j. But theta, we already know what that is. That's the angular displacement of that shaft or of that load. 
and its second derivative is the angular acceleration. So if somebody gives you the rotational inertia of that load, J, then you can plug that J value into your equations, which we are going to put into this equilibrium relationship in a minute. We now have a way of replacing tau sub m, that's simply k sub i, or k sub m i sub a. We now have described tau sub i as j theta double prime. What would be your thinking on tau sub b, the rotational damping torque? What was our, pardon? Yes, so this is now proportional to rotational velocity. And we'll just give you that proportionality constant to be a B again. So it's now B theta prime is tau sub B. Our damping torque then is equal to B theta prime. We can plug those three relationships into the equilibrium equation, and now we have k sub m i sub a is equal to j theta double prime plus b theta prime. That's tau sub m, the mechanical torque, is equal to the rotational the torque due to the inertia plus the damping torque. Now, that should just be screaming at you to take it into the frequency domain. We need to be very comfortable with moving between domains, going from time domain to frequency domain. And if we are interested in transfer functions, the, tra the Laplace transform is not that involved because we don't have to worry about initial conditions. If you now Laplace transform this, if we're now texting this to our friends, if we LTMS, if we Laplace transform the mechanical side, that's what that's supposed to be meaning, K sub M is just a constant. What happens when we Laplace transform the armature current? Nothing magic, it just becomes a capital letter, right? In the frequency domain, that's now I sub A of X. That's the left-hand side. Now, what happens when we Laplace transform the first term on the right-hand side? We just have an S squared to take a, into account those two derivatives. We now have S squared j theta of s. And likewise, when we Laplace transform b as a constant with respect to time, we now have s b times theta of s. And thinking back to what we wanted, we wanted a transfer function between the applied voltage v and the output angle theta that I sub A is sort of an intermediate variable we'd like to get rid of. So anywhere we see an I sub A, we would like to get rid of it or express it in terms of thetas and Vs. And we can do that by simply, in this equation, divide out the motor constant, K sub M, where now we can say, oh, from this equation, I sub A is simply S well, how do I want to write this? Let me put the S squared out front, sort of. S squared times this J over K sub M plus S B over M, M K sub M theta of S. That shouldn't be a stretch. Now, let's Laplace transform the electrical side. Okay. 
if we go back and remind ourselves what the electrical side looked like, if we now Laplace transform this, we have a V. That'll go over just as a capital. That's capital V of S. I, not differentiated, is just I of S. I sub A prime is an S, capital I sub A, and theta prime is an S, capital, well, I'm not very good at capitalizing theta. I'll just make it bigger. Theta of S. I'll give it an argument. Is that clear? That's Laplace transforming the electrical side. We now can say that this is V of S, and let me go ahead and put the V on one side and all the other terms on the other side. And I'm going to actually factor out the I sub A from those two terms that it shares in common. So that now this is V sub A times R sub A plus S L sub A I sub A of S plus K sub M times S theta. So S K sub M theta of S. And I'm almost home. I simply need to get rid of that intermediate express or value variable, the current in the induct in the armature circuit, and I have an equation for that in terms of theta. Let me substitute that in for I sub A of S, and now I end up with V of S is equal to R sub A plus S L sub A. Now I have that times S squared, J over K sub M, plus S B over K sub M, theta sub S, plus S K sub M, theta of S. And now I have my equation that I need. It only involves V's and thetas. Let me combine or factor out all of the coefficients that are scaling theta, and I, why don't I multiply both sides through by K sub M? So now I have K sub M V of S is equal to R sub A plus S L sub A S squared J plus S B plus S K sub M squared theta of S. So I multiplied both sides through by K sub M. And if I want this to look a little bit more like what I want it to result in, which is equation number six or line number six in table 2.5 of the book, I have an S in common in all of those terms on the right-hand side. I can factor out at least one S from that expression in square brackets, which allows me then to say that this is now S times, and let me go ahead and Say this is now S L sub A plus R sub A. This is now S J plus B plus K sub M squared theta sub S. And to get my transfer function of the input theta underneath the output V, I divide both sides through by theta, and I can divide both sides, or how do I want to do this? No, theta is my output. Theta is my output, V is my input. I need to end up with theta of S over V of S. So this whole thing on the right-hand side is going to end up in the denominator. K sub M is going to end up in the numerator. Meaning, I now want theta of S over V of S, and that's going to now be K sub M over S times 
S L sub A plus R sub A, S J plus B, plus A sub M squared. Questions on that? Now, you may end up with a problem where you need to simplify this. Meaning, if you were thinking about the relationship between the speed of an electrical circuit and the speed of response of a mechanical system, which would be faster? The electrical is much faster, isn't it? If you look at this parameterization that we have, this piece right here is due to the electrical part of the circuit. This piece is the mechanical. Now, if we rewrite those pieces, if we said, oh, what's the mechanical time constant in this system? Oh, before I do that, can you see how we would get omega of s over v of s from this transfer function? Omega is simply s theta, isn't it? So if we multiplied both sides through by s, that leading s in the denominator would vanish and we would have omega s over v of s. That would be our transfer function between the voltage and the shaft's velocity, the rotational angular rotation speed now let's look at the mechanical time constant it's associated with this factor this mechanical factor You remember how we get a time constant out of something like that? If I gave you a factor, S10 plus 7, and I said, what's the time constant associated with that factor? What would you do? Close. I don't even know where I put the 10, so maybe I speaking wrong. Did I say 10s plus 7? So now we want to normalize one of the coefficients and the one we want to normalize to 1 is the constant coefficient. So we would actually factor out that 7. In this case, what coefficient do we factor out to normalize the constant term to 1? The term not being multiplied by s. We would factor out the damping, wouldn't we? So that now if we did that, we would have B times S J over B plus 1. And now we have an S something plus 1. That's an S tau. And this tau is a time constant, not a torque. So don't, by context, it should be clear what the tau means. Now that I'm thinking about it. Oh, no, I called it tau sub m, and that was our, hmm, so how do I want to refer to this? Tau mechanical. So this is our mechanical time, well, I just labeled it. So there, it's the mechanical time constant, tau mech. That's equal to j over b. Does everybody see that? So that up here, we would have B, S, tau, mech, plus 1. Tau, mech is, let's say, in seconds. S is a frequency. That's 1 over seconds. And so the units are OK. We have S, tau, mech, plus 1. That's the mechanical time constant. What's the electrical time constant? We're trying to compare these. That's what I've highlighted in yellow, isn't it? That's the electrical dynamics, or 
associated with the electrical dynamics, we can find our electrical time constant from that. That's now this S L sub A plus R sub A. That was the electrical factor. If we do the same thing here, we factor out the resistor and we have S L sub A over R sub A plus 1. Or this is now R sub A S tau to be consistent, I guess I'll do elect plus 1. Where the electrical time constant is equal to L over R. Does that seem consistent with what you remember for time constant? The easy one to remember is RC, right? The RC time constant. For the inductor, it's L over R. But that's our electrical time constant. Now let's see how these might be related or the ratio between electrical time constant and mechanical time constant. You already told me the mechanical system is slower than the electrical system. Do the time constants sort of bear that out? What might be, uh, I'm sort of just attaching some values here somewhat artificially, but let's say the electrical time constant, which is L sub A over R sub A, suppose our inductor or our inductance was 1 millihenry, 0 0.001, and let's say we had a resistance of 1. So this electrical time constant is one millisecond, 0 0.001 second. That's how fast our electrical system responds in terms of time constant. And when would you quit seeing that behavior due to the electrical dynamics? After how many time constants? Five, roughly. So in five milliseconds, the electrical dynamics have stopped. Did you see it? We excited this system and boom, the electrical, we didn't even see it, did we? But over in the lab, what's going to happen? You're going to apply something, a force, to this system and it's mostly mechanical. So it has a mechanical time constant, but it also has an electrical time constant, but that's awfully fast. So the mechanical time constant, tau mechanical, surprised I'm still writing, my hand's kind of tingly if you miss that. The mechanical time constant, hopefully that didn't come over the speaker, or the microphone, J over B. Let's say that J, the rotational inertia is 0.5. And let's say our damping constant is 1. So this is now 1 half of a second. What's this ratio of tau mech to tau electrical. Whoops, what am I doing? Attaching a second. That's a ratio. 500. 500 to 1. Usually if you have a factor of 100, you can kind of neglect the one that's 100 times less than the other one. This is 500 times bigger. That's why we might be able to neglect the electrical dynamics in this expression, in this transfer function. If we go back, so let's say that that says, oh, let's now neglect the electrical dynamics. What in the world does that mean? What's the order of this system between the voltage of our DC motor and the rotational displacement? What's the order in this ideal incorporating both the electrical and mechanical dynamics? What's the system order? I hear a one. Did, a, did I get a two? Did I get a two? Did you two? Two. We got a two. Do we have a three? Do we have a three? We have a three? Do we have a four? A four anywhere? Four? 
any four, sold to three, the highest bidder, right? No, it's actually correct in this case. Three. <laughs> Why is that? It's the highest power of S. So you have to look at all of those S's, and if you multiplied that out, you would end up with an S cubed, wouldn't you? Now somebody gives you a transfer function, they go, oh, here's a transfer function of a DC motor, and it's second order. And you go, oh my goodness, that's not what we had in Tharp's class. <laughs> what happened? Well, maybe they're neglecting the electrical dynamics. How would you do that? If you factor out the R sub A from this factor, you will have R sub A times a quantity, S L A over R A plus 1. Now we've just said L A over R A is pretty small. If we just throw that, if we set that to zero, if we said let's approximate this and just let L sub A over R sub A go to zero, now we just have R sub A times the quantity 0 plus 1, that's just R sub A, and now what's the order of our system? Second order. Is that making sense? So if somebody says, oh, give me the really high-powered DC motor model, you would give them this. And then somebody says, I don't want to... I, the electrical dynamics are quite a bit faster. Can I just neglect those? You neglect those. Now you have this resistance. You're basically setting your inductance to zero, aren't you, in the circuit that we had. If you do that, now you have a second order system. Now somebody says, oh, here's a DC motor transfer function, and it's between the voltage and the rotation angular velocity. What's the order? And they're neglecting the system dynamics. Or, I'm, they're, they're, they're neglecting the electrical dynamics. They want some system dynamics. They're neglecting the electrical dynamics. So we neglected the electrical dynamics, and now we're saying V downstairs and omega upstairs. That means this guy goes away, doesn't it? The S goes away. And what's the system order? First order, isn't it? Now you have a first order transfer function between the voltage and the angular acceleration. And what's a first order response look like? So now you apply a voltage and that spins up and that's how your velocity is going to be. It's just going to reach a steady state value for a fixed voltage on a DC motor. Is that making sense? And the dynamics of that will be first order roughly, because the electrical is really, really fast, according to my hand. So if we neglect the electrical dynamics, this theta over S over V over S, second order. And if we wanted omega over S over V over S, first order. And I promised you a quiz. Okay, so let's do a quiz. This will really be just like the exam. You have two minutes <laughs> to do this exam, this quiz. Okay, in two weeks you might have two minutes to finish one of the problems. I hope not. Okay, you better not. Here is the system so this is a yes-no. You can quickly do this in two minutes. Whether it's correct or not is another story. You don't have to hand this in. I just want you thinking about it. Sorry. <laughs> but at least I woke you up, right? All right. Now, we're taking a quiz. We've got one minute. Is A linear? All right. Is B linear? Is C linear? Is D linear? Oh boy, what did I just hear? I heard this was yes, is that correct? I heard this was no. What was this one? Why? Well, why was this one not linear? 
we're multiplying x and y. For it to be linear, we only need variables to be themselves or their derivatives by themselves. And that's not happening here with this x, y. This piece gives us a nonlinear behavior. What about this one? That's, that's the troublemaker. This is a sign, that's a nonlinear operator on one of your variables, x and its derivative actually in this case. So that third one is no. What about d? It's what? Linear? Well, it has a sign in it. But that sign is a coefficient. This is just a coefficient. This is a time varying linear system, but it's linear. So D is linear. We'll pick up by trying to learn how do we linearize these if they're nonlinear because that's what we want to play with in this class, our linear equations.